the US weapon system that can strike any target with almost any weapon anywhere in the world without being detected by even the best radar systems, the vaunted B-2 Spirit Stealth Bomber. But despite over 30 years of battle-proven service, the B-2 will not be flying forever. Because of this, the US has been developing its eventual replacement for almost a decade. That replacement, known as the B-21 Raider, will eventually become the US Air Force's premier ultra-long-range strike capability. But how exactly do they stack up against one another? Before delving into the nitty-gritty of the capabilities and limitations of each platform, it's essential to understand their role and why such technology is more important in modern airspaces now than ever before. One of the main reasons for this is the proliferation of ground-based air defense systems. These systems are so common nowadays because purchasing and training personnel for air defense systems is a fraction of what it costs to purchase aircraft and train pilots. Because of this, pilots and defense industrial bases have played a cat-and-mouse game against these air defense systems with varying tactics and countermeasures to defeat them. However, the US decided to just avoid that problem altogether. But how? The US solution to this problem was the B-2 bomber. Although the US had several earlier attempts at stealth aircraft, like the A-12 and the SR-71, these were reconnaissance and surveillance aircraft. And though they were stealthy, they were not quite invisible. The US wanted to make not only an aircraft that would be totally invisible to any current or future air defense system, but could strike any target with any weapon anywhere around the globe. Because of this, the military decided that the aircraft should be able to carry both conventional and nuclear weapons. Hence, the B-2 was born. But after serving for over 30 years, the B-2 is getting ready for retirement. Wanting to keep the same dual-purpose aircraft capable of striking any target, the Air Force began to develop its replacement around 2015. Known as the B-21 Raider, this aircraft will fill the same role as the B-2. However, it's expected that the B-21 will host a slew of new top-secret technologies and weapon systems with unknown capabilities. So, with that being said, let's dive into some direct comparisons between the two. Starting with the basics, let's compare the data regarding size, weight, service ceiling, and other core aircraft capabilities. Between the two, the B-2 is going to be the larger aircraft, with a height of 17 feet, a length of 69 feet, and a wingspan of 142 feet. This OG stealth bomber is larger than its eventual replacement. While official confirmation on the dimensions of the B-21 have yet to be published, there is a good amount of open source data available to infer how big it'll be. The best answer comes from analyzing the temporary shelter built for the aircraft back in 2021 at Ellsworth Air Base in South Dakota. From pictures provided by the Air Force, aircraft enthusiasts were able to deduce the size of the hangar because of a pickup truck parked alongside it. Using estimates of the truck's size, these internet sleuths could calculate the approximate length and width of the hangar. Using these calculations, the prototype shelter for the B-21 means that the B-21 would have had a wingspan of no more than 140 feet and an overall length of no greater than 50 feet. Such an educated guess was confirmed by an official Air Force report that the B-21 will continue to use the same maintenance shelters as the B-2, meaning that at maximum it'll be no larger than it to fit underneath these facilities. As far as performance characteristics such as service ceiling, speed, weight, and operational distance, we don't know much about the B-21, but some inferences can be made with publicly available B-2 data. The B-2 is powered by four General Electric F-118 GE-100 turbofan engines that can propel the bomber at a max speed of around 626 miles per hour. That max speed is just below the sound barrier of approximately 761 miles per hour, but this was intentional since the design team did not want the plane to break the sound barrier since many factors involved with this, like afterburners, heat, and vapor trails, are much harder to mask. The B-21 will be powered by two turbofan engines instead of four, and these will instead be produced by Pratt & Whitney, the same company that makes engines for the F-35. It's unknown whether the B-21 will be faster than the B-2, but if it is, it cannot be much faster since the B-2's max speed is just below the sound barrier, and it's unlikely that engineers have conquered the challenges associated with keeping stealth bombers stealthy at supersonic speeds. Because of this, current estimates place the B-21's max speed at just under the B-2's 621 miles per hour. But while there may not be much difference in speed, there is expected to be a huge difference in payload and weight. As it sits now, the B-2 unloaded weighs 125,000 pounds. With its max allowable ordnance and fuel load, it can safely take off at just over 370,000 pounds. Because of this weight, the B-2 can carry 60,000 pounds of munitions. This starkly contrasts with the B-21, which can hold just under 30,000 pounds of ordnance. 
This difference comes about due to the Air Force's goal of increasing the range of the aircraft. With just under half a load of bombs, the B-2 can travel an impressive 6,600 nautical miles without refueling. By doubling that loadout to about 37,000 pounds, the unrefueled distance drops to 4,400 nautical miles. However, with one refueling, the operational range can be extended to a mind-boggling 10,800 nautical miles. Even so, the B-2 has a very impressive range. It's likely the Air Force is limiting the munitions the B-21 can carry because it wants the aircraft to be able to reach any target in the world without a single refueling. This is because in a worst-case scenario where a nuclear Armageddon is happening, a tanker may not be able to top off the bomber's gas tanks. By limiting the payload, the aircraft can probably carry more gas and achieve further operational ranges than before. As far as the surface ceiling, the new aircraft is likely to be able to fly higher than the B-2. Right now, the maximum surface ceiling of the B-2 is 50,000 feet, although the U.S. government has not publicly admitted they want to increase the ceiling. With advances in ground-based air defense radar systems being able to see higher than ever before, it is likely the B-21 will need to operate at higher altitudes to stay one step ahead of the air defense system developments and remain on scene no matter what advances the U.S. adversaries make. With the basic data comparisons down, the next aspect to look at is what makes a stealth bomber stealthy. As one can imagine, the US military has been very tight-lipped about what advances have been made in designing the B-21. But again, some good guesses can be made from what we know about the B-2. One of the first things one will notice about the B-2 is its unusual shape, and all of that was on purpose, because ground-based air defense systems and other aircraft use radar as the primary means to detect incoming threats. The B-2 is designed to reflect or absorb as much radar radiation as possible. The iconic W-shaped wings are meant to scatter incoming radiation energy. That way, even if an enemy radar site manages to direct energy toward the aircraft, the radar return will never make it back to the site, making it appear like there is nothing there. Additionally, few parts of the aircraft have some type of edge on it. Because flat surfaces reflect radar energy much easier than a rolled surface, the B-2 only has straight edges on a few systems, such as the landing gear. However, these systems are fully encapsulated by the time the plane reaches its cruising speed. Another exception would be the bomb bay doors. Of course, these doors are shut when in flight and only swing open when releasing ordnance. Once the payload's been delivered, the doors close and become flush with the aircraft's body again. But beyond the scattering of incoming energy, the aircraft has a host of other features that make it unique among military planes. Chief amongst those is its basic construction. Unlike most other aircraft, the B-2 has very little steel in its construction. In fact, the body and all of its components are comprised of over 200 different metals and alloys. For example, the body of the aircraft is comprised of about 80% composite materials built on a titanium and aluminum substructure. The bulk of the composite materials are made up of carbon, graphite, and glass fibers held together with plastic polymers. This very strong and durable material is then placed into molds for each part of the aircraft. Inside the mold, contractors heat the part to over 350 degrees Fahrenheit and at pressures greater than 100 psi. Once completed, the part is now much stronger than steel at just a fraction of the weight. Because the B-2 is made up of mostly composite materials, it's incredibly flexible and can be seen bending and flexing in flight, yet never suffer damage. However, another factor that hides the aircraft is its paint. The exact paint mixture that covers the aircraft is highly classified, and no one knows what it's comprised of. However, it is known that the paint has several components that must be mixed on site at maintenance hangars. This is probably a way to protect the actual formula used for it, since there is no one company that can make every part of the paint. But regardless of its composition, its main purpose is to absorb radar radiation. And as for the aircraft's distinctive color, it was implemented due to the extreme altitudes the plane operates in. Painting it black makes it blend in well with its surrounding environment. But the stealth features are not just on the outside of the aircraft, they're inside it as well. One of the main problems the engineers had to solve was how to prevent heat buildup around the aircraft's engine inlets and exhausts to prevent detection via infrared or heat-seeking means. A serpentine S-structured inlet was built to solve the issue with the inlets. Because of this, the actual engine blades are about one engine diameter below the actual inlet. The end result is that the heat from the engine is unable to be detected. But solving the heat that came out from the exhausts was a different problem, because the air that goes through the engine is going to be much hotter than the surrounding environment. A very easily identifiable heat trail would be left in the sky. 
To solve this problem, the designers built a system that mixes the heated exhaust air with the freezing ambient air to lower the heat signature of the exhaust to basically the environment's ambient temperature. And just to make sure there's no vapor trail, the team also created a special system that injects a special chlorofluoral sulfuric acid mixture into the exhaust plume just for good measure. Although the Air Force has not commented on what would make the B-21 different in regard to stealth tech, it's still unknown that changes, if any, would be made. Perhaps the Air Force created a better radar absorbent paint. Maybe the B-21 has new composite materials that are stronger, lighter, or cheaper to produce than before. Both of these are likely, since Air Force officials have made bringing down maintenance costs to a minimum a priority, and both these stealth components feature heavily in that calculation. Despite not knowing too much about the new developments the B-21 would have regarding stealth technology, there's a lot of public information about the weapons both aircraft can carry. Starting with the B-2, it can carry both nuclear and conventional weapons. As far as nuclear weapons, the B-2 carries two primary types. The first of these is the B-61 nuclear bomb. First entering service in the early 1960s, the B-61 was meant to be a versatile bomb meant to replace various nuclear weapons by putting their functionalities into one bomb that was compact, easily modified, and cheap to produce. Because of these features, almost 4,000 were eventually produced, with over 500 still in service today. These weapons are all variable yields that can be dialed in for the specific target. The yield ranges from as little as 0.3 kilotons up to 400 kilotons for the strategic models. The other nuclear weapon the B-2 can carry is the B-83 nuclear bomb. As the name suggests, the weapon entered U.S. inventories in 1983 as a strategic nuclear weapon. Hosting a massive 1.2 megaton yield, these bombs are also considered earth-penetrating weapons and are basically nuclear bunker busters. This means that like conventional bunker busters used to take out hardened command posts, aircraft shelters, and other priority targets, nuclear bunker busters are meant to defeat even the most hardened nuclear weapon shelters. All told, the B-2 can carry up to 16 of these city-destroying weapons. In regards to its conventional ordnance payloads, it can carry an even more dizzying array of weapons. Amongst its most common are Joint Directed Attack Munitions, or JDAMs for short. JDAMs themselves are not munitions, but rather kits that can be attached to dumb ordnance to make them precision GPS-guided weapons. The most common weapon system these are attached to are 500-pound bombs. Using these, a B-2 can deliver a devastating 80 bombs on top of any target without the enemy ever knowing they were even there. But if you thought that was powerful, the B-2 can deliver a weapon even more devastating than 80 GPS-guided bombs. Known as the GBU-57 Massive Ordnance Penetrator, this huge 30,000-pound bomb is six times larger than the standard Bunker Buster bomb. With only around 20 of these massive bombs in Air Force stocks, the bomb was specifically designed and produced to be fielded by the B-2. The purpose of this bomb was to destroy any adversary's nuclear weapons without having to resort to a nuclear strike using the B-83. Though dropping massive munitions and precision-guided weapons is one part of the core competencies of the B-2, another one is conducting long-range standoff fires. One of the first weapon systems designed for this purpose utilized by the B-2 is the AGM-86 air-launched cruise missile. As mentioned previously, ground-based air defense systems make the skies over enemy territory quite dangerous, but this has been the case for decades. In the 1960s, the U.S. sought a way to combine a decoy with a strike capability that could be fired outside Soviet airspace. After several trial programs and adjusting operational goals for the projects, in the end the result was the AGM-86. The purpose of the missile was to make it look like an obvious decoy is making its way to enemy territory so air defense systems don't pay as much attention to it. But that's exactly what the U.S. planners wanted, since when the enemy thinks they're just following a harmless radar contact, the decoy will suddenly shift course and strike a target with either a conventional or nuclear warhead. However, the AGM-86 is one of the many long-range weapons the B-2 can carry. Known as the AGM-158 Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile, or JASM, the missile satisfies the requirement of an ultra-long-range cruise missile meant for conventional targets. Able to be carried on almost every type of fighter and bomber aircraft in the U.S. inventory, the missile itself is not unique to the B-2 program like the massive ordnance penetrator is. Instead, the weapon gives the B-2 an extended range weapon with a publicly admitted range of 370 kilometers, which is likely far greater. And if you thought the B-2 could just strike targets on the ground, then you might have to think again. On top of the huge loadouts of its nuclear bombs, bunker-busting ordnance, and precision munitions, the B-2 can also strike ships. The tool it uses for this is the JASM Extended Range. 
Working throughout the 2000s to increase the range of the already deadly JASM, the ER variant pushes the range to an eye-popping 575 kilometers. With such a long range, the Air Force has been eyeing this weapon to enable the B-2 to bring its weapons to bear in the sea domain too. Such a move is definitely on the table, considering how the Air Force has armed B-52s with anti-ship harpoon missiles, and this only represents the latest development in that space. Speaking of latest developments, the B-21 is also expected to field these weapons and several new ones. Among these is a dedicated anti-ship missile known as the AGM-158CL RASM, which stands for Long Range Anti-Ship Missile. A brainchild created in collaboration between the US Navy and the Air Force, this weapon system was first imagined in the early 2010s as an eventual replacement for the aging and outdated harpoon missile. Building upon the principles of the iconic harpoon, the AGM-158C is even deadlier as it can seek targets further away. It has improved data links that are faster and more secure, and has a better engine to give it an increased range over the harpoon. So far, the weapon has been integrated into the B-1 bomber and is expected to form a core part of the B-21's inventory to give it a maritime strike capability. Another new weapon the B-21 will field is the AGM-181 long-range standoff weapon. This new missile replaces the aging AGM-86 that the B-2 currently carries. The Air Force has already stated that the LRSO will be nuclear-armed, with a W-80 low-yield warhead. Other weapons like the JASM ER will continue to fill the conventional role of extended strike systems. But even though there is a dizzying array of weapons on board both the B-2 and B-21, none of these weapons mean much if there's no robust combat system suite on board each aircraft. Between the various avionics, radar, software, and communication equipment on board, both the B-2 and B-21 are among the most sophisticated and self-reliant aircraft the US has ever built. Starting with the B-2, the aircraft hosts a wide range of advanced electronics and combat systems equipment. While much of what the plane carries is inevitably highly classified, there's enough information publicly available to build up a picture of what the aircraft is capable of. For the basic systems on board, the B-2 utilizes an incredibly fast fly-by-wire system. Essentially, the pilot gives the orders he or she wants, and the orders are converted to electrical signals that go to the various parts of the aircraft controlling safe flight in a closed-loop feedback system. While not extraordinary technology, at the time the B-2 was being developed, this was a revolutionary technology. Another technology that today is more common but during development was unusual is satellite communications or SATCOM. SATCOM is a way for ships and aircraft to communicate with satellites via secure data links. This is such a huge deal because the communication ranges can be much greater. If a plane had to rely on communicating with a ground tower, the range would be quite limited based on the tower's height, atmospheric conditions, and other factors outside the pilot's control. Obviously, as the B-2 operates at such extreme ranges, this would have severely limited its operational capability. This leap in technology allows satellites to act like radio towers and can securely send information to anyone with secure data links. Because of this, the B-2 can communicate with practically anyone in the world at any time. Beyond its flight control systems and communication suite, the B-2 has an ace up its sleeve regarding combat systems. That ace is the AN-APQ-181 Phased Array Radar. The radar forms the core capability for both the B-2's navigation and targeting systems. As for navigation, the radar allows the aircraft to operate in a GPS-denied environment. The radar and its corresponding software programs essentially allow the aircraft to travel without outside input and pinpoint accuracy because of its various operating modes that include precision, position, and velocity updates. In addition to these features, the radar has features that allow it to use organically generated pictures of the terrain below the aircraft and man-made features like towers that can be passed on to the pilots to allow for safe navigation. But when the B-2 needs to transition to the targeting phase of a mission, the pilots can switch the radar to operate as a Synthetic Aperture Radar, or SAR. When operating in the SAR mode, the radar can take topographic photos of the ground below. These photos are of map quality and are consistent no matter the altitude of the aircraft. These photos are of such a high quality, they can be used to identify targets and are also used for battle damage assessment once the payload's been deployed. Another newer addition to the combat suite for the B-2 that the B-21 will certainly have is the Radar-Aided Targeting System, or RATS. 
While the B-2 has been able to deploy conventional ordnance and GPS-denied environments for a long time, it has been thought that deploying a nuclear weapon without GPS was too risky, considering what could be at stake if the bomb missed its target. While certainly the National Command Authority could have ordered a strike in a GPS-denied environment, this new software program gives B-2 crews the certainty they need that the onboard systems can now, without a doubt, deploy nuclear weapons with the exact same precision as conventional weapons without the need for GPS. While the sensors, combat suites, and avionics for the B-21 are still highly classified and probably will be for the foreseeable future, the B-21 is expected to keep many of these legacy systems that are still viable. However, one major difference between the two is that the Air Force has stated the B-21 can conduct both manned and unmanned operations. Just exactly what kind of unmanned missions the Air Force intends to send the B-21 on is unknown at this time. Would the U.S. send a fully autonomous nuclear-armed bomber to carry out the nation's nuclear tasking? Perhaps, and here is why. Stealth bomber pilots are very hard to come by. Between the years of training and strict standards, there are only about 80 B-2 pilots at one time. Because of this, if a country attacked the U.S. and somehow managed to knock out those pilots on the ground, the U.S.'s ultimate survival weapon would be toast. But of course, this is just speculation. Just how unmanned the B-21 will be and what that would look like is anyone's guess at this point in time. Despite not knowing much about the B-21's unmanned systems, there is a lot of public information about the cost and production of both these fearsome aircraft. The premise for the B-2 began in the late 1970s when the military sent some classified feelers out to the defense industry about the feasibility of such a project. Once the project began to expand, by 1980, it was too big to keep a secret and the U.S. was forced to disclose for the first time that the military indeed had such an aircraft in development. Once the proverbial cat was out of the bag, there was much debate in the public space and Congress over the need and cost of the aircraft. During the 1980s, the U.S. Air Force proposed acquiring 133 B-2s, including one prototype test plane. The program was expected to cost around $35 to $40 billion over a five-year production run. The plane's defenders justified the huge price tag as the ultimate weapon that could penetrate Soviet airspace with ease, no matter the situation. So, even though many of the plane's detractors thought the price was too high, they continued to support it for that reason. That was until the USSR collapsed in 1991. After the fall of the Soviet Union, the U.S. suddenly had no one to challenge it. As a result, military spending was slashed across the board, and the U.S. military conducted one of the largest drawdowns of forces in the 20th century. While congressional officials were busy slashing budgets, military officials were fighting to save their pet projects. Chief among them was the B-2 bomber. Because of huge spending cuts and a less urgent need for such a superweapon, the Air Force compromised on getting just 75 B-2s. But even that was not enough of a cut. As the B-2 entered production, many wrinkles had to be worked out in its design and part production. Throughout the 90s, debate raged in Congress over the huge costs, both in production and maintenance of the B-2. Eventually, when the price tag reached a whopping $2.1 billion back in 1997, Congress had enough and slashed further funding of the project. The Air Force would have to make do with what it had, and all told, a total of 21 B-2 bombers were delivered to the Air Force, with 20 still serving today after one B-2 was lost in an accident. As for the B-21 Raider, its inception came about in 2009 when the Air Force first started asking for help endorsing a new stealth bomber. By 2013 to 2014, the program was officially rolled out as the Long Range Strike Bomber Program. By this time, the B-2 was approaching its third decade of service, and the Air Force knew it would take about 10 to 20 years to bring the B-2's replacement to initial operational capability. After soliciting offers from the defense industry, the Air Force awarded the contract to Northrop Grumman in 2015. One of the key reasons why the company won the contract was because the Department of Defense put a firm fixed price of $550 million per aircraft, regardless of inflation. Once Northrop Grumman won the contract, it took nearly seven years to build the first B-21, which was unveiled in December 2022. While the aircraft is expected to take its maiden flight sometime in 2023, the program is a few months behind schedule, according to DoD officials. But despite this minor setback, the program is still expected to deliver at least 100 and as many as 200 B-21s to the Air Force. Even though the B-2 program was greatly curtailed and the number of aircraft eventually delivered to the military, that doesn't mean the plane has not been an active contributor to combat operations. In fact, despite having just 21 available combat aircraft for most of its service, the B-2 has punched well above its weight in operations around the globe. 
The B-2 made its combat debut on the evening of March 24, 1999, in the aftermath of the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. The Balkans had been embroiled in a series of conflicts throughout the 90s. The last of these conflicts centered around the Serbians carrying out attacks against ethnic Albanians in the Kosovo region. Wanting to put a stop to the bloodshed, the UN and NATO got together to form a coalition to cripple the Serbian military. But there was a problem. Serbia had some of the most advanced air defense systems and heavily defended skies in Europe. Regular conventional aircraft were in great danger of being shot down because of this. However, this was the exact situation the B-2 was made for. B-2 bombers were supposed to go into the country to eliminate Serbian air defenses to allow other aircraft safe passage to carry out further strikes. Throughout their 78-day air campaign, the B-2 successfully neutralized Serbian air defense systems, airfields, and transportation means like railway bridges and crucial roads. All told, the B-2s flew just 1% of the total sorties, yet destroyed around a third of all targets in the conflict. One of the lessons learned from its combat debut was the need for extended basing, crew changeouts, and multiple aerial refuelings. The lessons learned would pay huge dividends just a few years later after the terrorist attacks of 9-11. In the immediate aftermath of the attacks, the US military began a huge air campaign to eliminate the Taliban as a viable military force in Afghanistan. But because the Taliban had amassed an arsenal of low-tech but high-quantity air defense weaponry and manned portable systems, the B-2 went in first to prepare the battle space for follow-on strikes. During the initial strikes, the B-2 set a record that still holds true to this day. Leaving their base in Missouri, six B-2 bombers went on a mission to destroy Al-Qaeda base camps in the country. Flying an astonishing 44 hours to the target area, the crews had to conduct multiple aerial refuelings as well as land for a crew changeout and quick maintenance check en route to the target areas. After releasing their payloads, the B-2s returned to base 30 hours later for an astonishing 70-plus hours of total flight time to Afghanistan and back. But while the B-2 helped quickly neutralize the Taliban regime as an organized military force and helped turn it into a guerrilla army, the bomber was soon tasked with an even bigger operational headache. When the US invaded Iraq in 2003, the B-2 was to be at the forefront of taking out critical targets ahead of the invasion force. But there was a problem. The sorties to Afghanistan demonstrated the need for forward basing. By moving closer to the combat zone, crew fatigue and maintenance on the aircraft could be cut down significantly. Because of this, the secret Navy base at Diego Garcia was chosen as the launching point for B-2s since it was just a five-hour straight shot into downtown Baghdad. Soon after arriving in Diego Garcia, the B-2 demonstrated its combat prowess by destroying an Iraqi command post in Baghdad on the evening of March 27, 2003. The command post was supposed to be the headquarters where Iraqi officials were organizing guerrilla attacks by the Fedayeen militia, as well as generating kill lists for Iraqis suspected of collaborating with coalition forces. The attack on the command post was filmed and cemented the legacy of the plane to strike any target anywhere. But during the 43 combat sorties the B-2 carried out during the invasion, the bomber attacked more than just air defenses and critical infrastructure. It also attacked large Iraqi troop formations in the open, such as one attack on a Republican Guard armored division that was assembling to launch a large-scale counterattack on American troops. The bombers decimated the unit and thwarted the planned attack. Once Iraqi freedom transitioned to an insurgency, the B-2 saw less and less use until 2011 when Operation Odyssey Dawn was launched. On March 2011, NATO got together to help topple the Gaddafi regime since he'd been using his military to carry out indiscriminate attacks on civilians to make up for his forces' poor performance on the battlefield. Over a two-week campaign, coalition air and naval units pounded Libyan military targets. Among these were the B-2, which carried out strikes against air defense systems and airfields to pave the way for coalition aircraft to do their work. Even after the Gaddafi regime fell, the B-2s would still see action over Libya. In the power vacuum left after Gaddafi's downfall, terrorist groups started setting up shop in Libya, including the country's ISIS affiliate. In the summer of 2017, a large gathering of ISIS fighters met up southwest of the crucial city of Sirta, which had been taken from ISIS in the previous year. Because Libya had robust air defenses, competing factions, and many people sympathetic to the ISIS cause, it was decided to use a B-2 bomber to guarantee this large gathering of ISIS militants could be taken out. And it was. With the help of special forces on the ground giving real-time feedback, B-2 bombers took out over 100 militants who were planning attacks in Europe and the US. 
Despite the B-21 not having any operational history yet, since it's still in testing, each aircraft brings a unique set of pros and cons to the table that complement one another. As for the B-2, it's a stealth bomber that's in a class of its own. Its unique combination of sensors, a vast array of weapons, and numerous highly classified stealth technologies make it the ultimate aerial weapon in modern airspaces. However, the B-2 is not without its faults. The worst drawback is its massive cost, with an estimated operating cost of $63 million annually that comes out to a staggering $135,000 per flight hour. On top of this, the aircraft is very finicky and needs a lot of expensive routine maintenance. It's for this reason that those expensive temperature-controlled shelters and hangars were made. As for the B-21, it has a host of improvements over the B-2. For starters, it'll be vastly cheaper to produce and maintain. From the beginning, the Air Force has been adamant about making the B-21 as cost-effective and easy to maintain as a regular fighter aircraft. Additionally, with its better engines and lighter weight, it's supposed to have a far greater operational range than the B-2 and should be able to carry more advanced weapon systems. It's also expected that the B-21 will have even better stealth technology, since it's enjoyed several decades of further research and development in the field. But of course, the main drawback of the B-21 is all of its pros are just theories at this point. Until the plane becomes operational, this is all just speculation about what it can or cannot do. One of the main pros of it being cost-effective might get wiped out depending on production and relegate the future air fleet to a size comparable to the current B-2 program. Even though the B-21 is yet to be proven with how successful the B-2 program has been, it's very likely that the US Air Force can and will deliver on all the promises of this aircraft. But while there might have been plenty of developments to improve on the B-2, this OG stealth bomber is still unmatched in the skies. Improving on this already legendary system will make the B-21 a force to be reckoned with decades after the last B-2 is eventually retired from service. Now go check out Most Deadly US Military Weapon right now, or click this video instead.